Are you ready to learn about the property market? Then you're in the right place. This is Everything Property by Pivotal Homes, where we connect Australia's best developers, agents, home buyer specialists, wealth creation experts, and property advisors to the people of Australia. Broadcasted from Whitehorse Studios on the Gold Coast. And now, here are your hosts, Hayden Ashton and Tom Egan. G'day listeners and viewers right across the country. Welcome to Everything Property by Pivotal Homes, where we connect Australia's best developers, agents, home buyer specialists, wealth creation experts, and all-round property advisors to the people of Australia. Today's guest has more than 15 years in the property and finance industries. He has carved a successful career in the real estate industry, completing developments in not only Australia, Australia but the U.S., he is con- currently conducting developments in excess of $20 million and managing a further $30 million via his project management firm. He is a qualified real estate agent, mortgage broker and financial planner. It gives me great pleasure to welcome onto Everything Property, Scott Northcott, founder of Real Property Advice and host of Xenium Live. Mate, welcome. Hey, thanks <laughs> fellas. How you going? <laughs> thanks for coming on. Mate, the intros are a little bit uh, <laughs> intimidating, I know. It's... Uh, <laughs> I've sort of created the wave for it now, so we have to keep it rolling. I mean, you could have gone on for hours. (laughs) That's right. No, Tommy said, look, don't make it too big. I said, look at all the info I've got to work with. I could sit all day. Mate, um, thanks so much for for coming on um, to the show. Really appreciate uh, having you on to to chat about multiple facets of... um, of of the industry, uh, both development and uh, and wealth creation and uh, and everything property, as the name suggests. But what I like to do um, to start off uh, is just provide some context as to how you got in the industry, what you do. Um, I mentioned your companies there, Real Property Advice and, and uh, Zenium Live, what they're about, um, just to give the, the viewers and the listeners some sort of context of, of where you're coming from. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Real Property Advice is, a, is an advisory firm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we work with financial planners, mortgage brokers and accountants and direct clients uh, to really uh, nut down and uh, give people specific advice you know, individual advice to their situation. Uh, we don't have sort of prepackaged things. So that was really where Real Property Advice came to the front, uh, coming out of GFC and, and helping people get in, out of property, manage property, that sort of stuff. So that's what uh, RPA does. Um, and then the, the Zenium side of things was uh, really an extension of that. So we would find ourselves always educating a client before we went and did something. Yep. And uh, I said, uh, that's fine, we can do that, but let's try and do that on larger scale and we'll, we'll educate you know, groups of people or do, we'll just push more information out there. And the other thing with Zenium as well was that it was uh, a combination of all the different strategies that we work on in RPA and kind of like a supercharging system uh, for people's portfolio. So we wanted people to be active rather than just passive because some people uh, choose to do either or. Mm. Right? Sometimes they do both. Uh, but very much that they, they say we want to buy something and hold it for 20 years where there was a really a contingent of people that said, oh, well, you know, I've been hit by GFC or I've been hit by some sort of event and I want to see if I can make this down a bit quicker rather than just buy and hold. Because they don't have the time. The, you know, the, the retirement clock is ticking. Well, that's it. You get, you know, 50, 55-year-olds and mm. they go, you know, i got 10 years. Yeah, I've done nothing. What can I do? Mm. And it's like, well, you can buy and hold for 10 years or we can probably try and be a bit more aggressive. How do you get more aggressive in property? Well, you've got to be active, right? You've got to be active in it. And that's where the Zenium concept came. And so that we started educating people on that. That was about 15-odd uh, months ago. And that's morphed into a, you know, a weekly you know, or a bi-weekly show uh, where we, we also have guests on and we push out that information regularly. Yeah, mate, nice. And yourself, how did you get into the, the industry? <laughs> So my last industry was uh, telecommunications, right? And uh, I ended up at uh, the largest repair centre when they used to repair phones in Australia, and uh, and I was like kind of second in charge there, and and <coughs> been there seven odd years and nine years all up in telecoms, and uh, I decided to have enough and and leave. And when when I was there, one of my final jobs was ne- negotiating contracts with Nokia, Ericsson, Motorola, all those names of that you don't know. <laughs> <now>. <laughs> the unbreakable 3310, <laughs> wasn't it? What was <laughs> that, Nokia? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so you three turned the brick yeah. red brick. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and I've uh, you know I've actually got a yellow eighty one ten still I bought from JB the other yeah. day. I just, so I have to get that. Yeah, right. Throwback. They're still selling them, <laughs> but yeah, they are. It's, yeah, it's right. Not as good as the original, but yeah, uh, yeah. Anyways, besides the fact of <laughs> showing how old I am, um, I I left and went. Oh, what am I going to do? I like property. You do this. Oh, I'm pretty good at negotiating stuff for people. What do they spend the most amount of money on? Is either cars or houses? They spend more on houses. I'll go and help them do that. That mm. was it. Yeah, right. That was <laughs> a buyer's agent. And you already were you already <laughs> like investing or interested in property, or you were just yeah, I was. Yeah. And then we were helping some people do bits and pieces, but I was chasing cash flow. Yeah, right. So that led me to the US in two thousand three, four, and five, and we were, you know, that's when I left <laughs> left my job then, early oh four, and uh, said I will go and find property in the US. So at the time, that was when most Aussies were chasing New Zealand. There was that time back then where they all went to New Zealand to mm-hmm. go and invest. And I looked at that and I said, well, if the whole of the Australian investment population, which is never going to happen, but if a big portion went to New Zealand, it's going to screw over their market. If everyone everyone in Australia, even if they didn't invest in property, went to the US, they wouldn't even notice. Yeah, that's so right. So let's go there, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, And so that's that was, once again, those sort of either-or thought patterns. And uh, we ended up being, you know, second or third sort of company in the US from Australia at that time doing that sort of stuff. Uh, and we were buying property for between, say, twenty to 45000 US. So this is pre-GFC? Yeah, well before. Yeah. So this is 2005? 04, 04, yep. 05. Yep. And we were buying, and they were getting sort of 25 to 28%, you know, cash yields on them. Uh, and they're all Section 8 tenants, which is like government Per assist. annum. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow. Because <coughs> they were just so cheap. But they all had hairs on them, right? They yeah, needed okay. work, needed this and that. And the biggest problem was management. So in each area, it had a totally different system. And they don't even anything like property management here. Uh, and it was just dodgy as. Yeah, right. So uh, the reason we got out is we had some problems with our contractors over there that they got tied up and did bits and pieces. And we... We would every time we'd exit a property, like the the market was just kept going up and up, and I'm going, I I can't justify why this is happening. I don't know why this market's doing this, and uh, my wife was pregnant with our second child, and I went, you know what? I can't figure this market out. I don't know why it's doing this. I'm over the trips to the US, so I'll come back here and do something here. I'll just find property for people here. I don't know what it is. Found out it's called a buyer's agent. Yeah. <laughs> Knew I had found it had to be licensed, right? So I went and did that. Yeah, right. Wow. And that um, so the American market obviously has changed a lot thereafter from from then on. So exiting at that time was probably a uh, a blessing. Yeah. So we had all our clients out by that time, and uh, and we still had a couple of properties there. Uh, but like I didn't pick a GFC or anything. I just mm. picked that I couldn't work the market. Like mm. it just turned weird. Is all I'd sort of say, right? And and the yields were all funny. And funnily enough, the, after I did my real estate licence and uh, and we were w- working as a buyer's agent, back then it was called Queensland Buyer's Agent, coming into GFC here, uh, we were telling people to not buy because the yields were funny, but in a different sort of way to mm. the US, they were all low. It was like, oh, the, the price is too high. You know, the yields aren't, the, you know, like stuff that was traditionally 5%. You know, we're sitting at three and a halves or three point twos. I'm going, doesn't make any sense. Mm. Why is that? So don't buy. Just just wait and see mm. what happens, or we'll go somewhere else. And uh, and then you know, then we had GFC. Yeah, right. <laughs> and mate, so what's your thoughts? Obviously, um, everyone in Australia has an has a has an opinion on on the on the property market. We all seem to um, consider ourselves experts, but it's good to have one in the studio. Um, what's your <laughs> thoughts? Yeah, uh, yeah, Tom, so what do you think? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Anyway, over to you, mate. Uh, no, what, what's your <laughs> thoughts on, on the current market? Obviously, we had earlier in the year the, 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 a lot of the media outlets predicting doom and gloom, um, drops 30 to 40%, etc. cetera. You know, Westpac come out the other day with some sort of positive forecast. Yeah. What do you think personally uh, is, is on the radar um, for the Australian property market in, in the ba- in the fourth quarter of 2020 and, and obviously in, into 20, 20, 2021? Well, I think that um, all those experts really don't have any idea, so they just mm. keep putting out information. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, one of them's got to be right. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, you say, like, I predicted this. Like, you also predicted 10 other things, well, mate. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the old saying, right? Yeah, like, yeah. A, a broken clock is right twice a day. So, mm. 
you know, at some point they're going to be right about something, yeah, maybe. Yeah. But if they keep moving their perspective, then they could just always be wrong. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you know, make a good point about the banks. They were sort of doom and gloom, and now they're going, oh, hey, uh, you know, maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. What is it? A fifteen percent increase from twenty one to twenty two. Twenty percent in Tw- Brisbane. Yeah. Twenty percent. Yeah. From yeah. twenty one to twenty three. You know, <laughs> so I think they've just got really big dartboards, is mm. what I think, you know, and they just go, what are we doing today, fellas? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And away we go. You know, what do they base it on? Oh, look, I mean, the, the thing with markets is it's highly based on sentiment. Mm. Whether it's property markets or stock markets or whatever, it's about how, you know, they, they are priced emotively, mm. you know. Um, if someone desires something, they'll pay more for it. If someone is positive about the future, they'll they'll believe that the prices are going to go up, so they'll pay more for it. Mm. And the the reverse is true. You know, if they if they don't want it or they're negative about the future, they'll pay less for it, and the markets price accordingly. Mm. So sentiment drives a lot of that stuff. Um, in terms of the technical aspect of where we're going, it's it's really going to depend on what we see you know come out i'm a big believer of of all gains ending up in the land mm-hmm. okay and this is a this is a topic that was you know i'd first heard about uh about six years ago from uh, australian economist bill anderson and so I, I did my head in when i first heard it but essentially and i have arguments with financial planners about it all the time because mm-hmm. you know they totally disagree but if you think about you know if you take that on as a basis and I don't have to go into that if you don't want to. But no, the, no, absolutely. The, yeah. the thing is, is that, you know, where does this spending end up? It has to end up somewhere. Mm. And the whole gains end up in the land concept is, you know, take this pen, for example, like it's manufactured somewhere. So it's not manufactured online. Yeah. You might buy it online, but it's manufactured in a building. And those people live in a building and they go to a shop, even if they buy online, the shops on in a building, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean. And the pen, the materials come out of the ground. They they're trip, stripped, uh, sorry, transport across the road or the sea. You know what I mean. So mm. all of this, I go and spend money online on a pen, but where does that money end up? It ends up at the end of the day in gains, and uh, and we're going to see that come out through this infrastructure spending, other bits and pieces. I'm not saying it's going to be immediate, but at the end of the day, it will wash through. Mm. And so is that so in when you say gains up in the land, so would that mean that advocating for for sort of houses or with land content is 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 more with what you would do for your clients? Yeah. Uh, or has it come down to personal situation and scenario? Yeah, see that's something that people get confused on. They say that, you know, the land's the part that go up in value, so mm. I'm gonna buy a larger block. There's plenty of cheap, larger blocks, mate. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Let's go to Gundu, Indy. That's, <laughs> that's right. where I grew up. <laughs> exactly my point. Yeah. Right? yeah. Well, you have, a, you know, five metre split level blocks. They're always twice the size. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. you go to, say, Malulabar Beachfront or Gold Coast Beachfront or whatever, yeah. and there's tiny towers. Well, th- y- you know, there's 20 towers, uh, 20 units there. They technically own a portion of the land, yeah, yeah. right? But it's hugely valuable because mm. of where it is. So it's it's not necessarily just a sizing thing; it's a location thing, and y- what you will probably hear in this part of this, you know, the cycle. We always talk about cycles. Is that uh, you will see this government spending come out? But w- if you haven't heard it already, you'll talk about um, governments, especially this time round. We'll talk about land value capturing, and land value capturing is where that they are looking to capture the value uplift of the land because of infrastructure spending. So the theory goes like this. The public purse, i.e. government, spends money in an area uh, to provide a new rail station Mm -hmm. or a new school or whatever, right? And then the property around it has an increase in value because of that. Now, as an investor, that's the sort of stuff you chase, right? I mean, I had... Terry Ryder on our show last week, and he's real big on the the infrastructure stuff, yeah. follow the money, you know, where that is, because of this reason. And there's plenty of reports, especially out of the UK, and there's actually in a report in Australia as well, specifically on land value capture. It's a really interesting read if you like that stuff, but if you don't like most people, <laughs> then it'd be really boring. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, I like that stuff, and especially the one out of the UK, um, they did studies over different rail stations or railway lines, and 
there was one where they'd spent uh, three and a half billion to put the new railways in and the rail stations, and they had uh, documented a thirteen billion uh, dollar value increase in the property that benefited from the three point five billion dollars spend. So it was a three point seven one times wow. multiplier. So meaning that if you spend a billion dollars publicly in that area, the land values around increase by three point seven billion. Mm. So governments go, well, who gets that? Well, the landowners get that currently. So that's why you chase that as an investor. But one of the things to be watching out for, and they're already starting to talk about it, is governments are saying, well, I want to partake in that. Mm. Okay? So the concept is now that we will inject this money in as an infrastructure spend, but there could be a way where we could spend a billion dollars and either get it back or make money on it, right? Because we can capture the value mm. uplift accordingly mm. from the surrounding properties. Everyone else is making money. That's it. So, so would they do that on in terms of land banking themselves or potentially new tax reform to, to or a mixture? What do they know, mate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to be land banking, Yeah, yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's going to be fees or taxes or levies or, mm. you know, all this sort of stuff. So... That's what they're looking at doing, and and with in terms of railway, with that that inland railway uh, in Australia, the company that's looking to that's put the proposal to the government on that you know, is called Clara, it's right? A Consolidated Land and Rail Association, mm-hmm. or something, and uh, they got a website on, it and that's what they're looking to do. They're looking to say, well, we can fund this and use the value uplift from what we create in the property around it to actually self fund it. Mm. So the concept is okay. It just depends on how far in your pocket they're going to reach. Mm. So in short, um, we're looking out for government infrastructure or big infrastructure spend in areas, purchase in and around that, and we'll do well. Well, a really good example of infrastructure is, say, schools only. Yep. Okay. So we're all familiar with that. And there could be uh, you know, two identical houses, even on like – same street mm. where a school zone goes through right and the school is really really popular and in demand and that house that is identical will sell for substantially more than the house that's not in a school zone prime yeah. example of that you is know? rochdale yeah. um yeah we did some terrace style homes there probably five or six years ago and one half of the estate was in the mansfield high school catchment which is a very popular school amongst that um especially that asian demographic yeah and one was hang on i've got crickets in my pocket <laughs> Uh, and one was not, and so the, like there was literally a two hundred to three hundred thousand dollar difference. Hence the like such the importance that residents or owners or investors placed on being in that school catchment. Yeah, it was one side of the street or the yeah, other. Yeah, it was. I remember it was one road down the road, the opposite side it's of each other. Exactly, fell into that catchment zone or not? Yeah. Yep. no one's buying there for that price. Yeah. It just and it was literally houses across the road. I remember. Yeah. When, when we were selling, we always had to check, and you always knew the developers knew by the pricing, but. When he, whenever you sold anything, it was like that was a one requirement. Before sourcing for the client, it had to be this. Yeah. Okay, well, you need an extra, th- yeah, 200000 300000 Yeah, mm. and now just yeah. imagine that that was overlaid afterwards, right? Let's say that they were both were the same price back in the day, yeah. four hundred grand house and land package or something, mm. and then they didn't sell for 15 years, but that the overlay had changed, the zoning was created, the school got popular. Mm. You know, the next thing, old mate sells his house for 500 and this guy's selling his house for 900 Yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. They paid the same thing for, you know, 10, 15 years earlier. Yeah. That's, that's the, the private purse, you know, the landlord benefiting from public spending. Mm. Now, you know, is that good or bad? I'm not here to debate that. I'm saying while the system's there, you've got to know how to play it. Mm. You know, so that's yeah. the sort of stuff that you've got to chase. Yeah, and that's what you're looking out for. That is what you're looking out for. (laughs) Mm. Like you said, if you're trying to be active, and especially for the 50-year-old that wants to make more money, as well, even though that might be a different type of product, you need to be active on what's actually going to yield an extra $200,000 over 10 years. This is the thing, and the biggest issue with property investment that I've ever found is that, um, you know, no two properties are ever identical. I mean, Mm. even in a townhouse complex, right? There's slight differences, or ones at an end, or ones Aspects, across the, you know, yeah. that's right. There's always, you know, certainly there's justification for price differences, but it's even more so with housing. Mm. And so that's the first thing. The second thing is that no one goes back and checks, right? No one goes back and says, well, 15 years ago, I had the choice of these three properties. I bought this one. I wonder what the other two did. Yeah. Right? You know, whereas you can go and compare stocks and shares, you can go and compare cars. 
you know, a 2011 Mazda 3 whatever in red is there's, there's hundreds of them, mm. right? You know, you know what you're getting. Is it good condition or not good condition? That's what you pay the difference for. But you don't do that in property. So no one goes back and looks at what a difference in their decision could make for them down the track, mm. probably because they don't want to know mm. or probably because it's too hard. Mm. Yeah. And that information is available. Yeah. Not many people realise that you can look at a lot of historical data and, and uh, on individual properties as well and find out totally. what that property is ever sold, rented for and who mm. owns it. Well, you want to pay for access and premium. Some people don't want to pay it, but it's like long term that could save you a fortune to have access to what's selling in the area. Not not what people are pricing things for. What is it selling? Well, th- this is the thing. And I mean, when I first started as a buyer's agent, there's a guy down the Gold Coast, typically Gold Coast. Hey, <laughs> hey, 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 you can't <laughs> pay us all with the, the same, bro. Mate, you're all Gold Coast. <laughs> Sunshine Coast is where the real I know I've got live, a good mate. tan on, mate. I haven't we watch shoes and my yeah, cap, we we gold cap teeth. So <laughs> <laughs> they yeah, they right. had a running total of the money they save clients yeah. right, on the buyer's agent website. It was like a running total ticking over. And it was all based on, you know, the list price versus the price they got it for, <laughs> yeah. which is fair enough of sorts, except I'd say, well, I would never have paid the list price. Yeah, I haven't right. saved you anything. I've kind of got you the money that I thought we mm. should pay for it, right? Mm. So it's all it's all perspective. Yeah. And you go and look at that sort of stuff, you know, I did ha- what – so clients will say, well, you know, how do you justify doing what you do or how do you justify your fee or whatever? And um, – and that's that's one thing. Well, you know, we never really want to pay that. I mean, we have pulled it, we have bought at purchase price, we have bought at list price. Sorry, you know, not often, but we do. If we think it's priced well, mm. you know, we bought there. But we we yeah. buy according to our price research, yeah. not based on what the pricing is. Mm. And the other thing I do is, you know, we can sort of justify this or the time taken or the inspections, etc. But what we can't tell you, and is worth more than all of that, is. We're saving you making the wrong move, mm. right? Or yeah. buying the wrong property because that you can only justify that value once it happens. Yeah, in twenty years. <laughs> time yeah, that's and right. Yeah. You're going to remember, and you, you know, so it's yeah. really, you know, you got to remember that. And a lot of um, uh, we we spoke about it probably ten episodes ago, one of our early podcasts. But um, a lot of people in Australia rely for their buying advice from people who are selling the property. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. I mean, when I um, when I was going through to get my real estate license back in the day, it was the Property Agents and Motor Dealers Act, mm. and I'd done the real estate license. So it was one of I sell mean, a car, you can sell a house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is the thing, right? Yeah. This is the thing. So it, you know, I went through, and I was I was one of the only people in the the course that hadn't had real estate experience. Yeah, I'd come from a business background, and uh, and I I it was really scary because I duxed. The Blumen, there was one segment in there which was like university level. The rest is like just you don't want to know. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to know what real estate agents actually have to know. Um, and we've done it. And, and I and I Tom blitzed failed. that section, right? <laughs> yeah, never looked through. I, I blitzed that section. It was the section on financial management of a uh, of an agency. And the guy pulled me aside. And goes, "Oh man, you really know what you're doing with an agency, you know?" And I said, "Mate, I've never worked as an agent <laughs> yeah. ever in my life. I have no idea. I've never even heard about trust accounts. We started this course, right? Yeah, yeah. But and I went through and went, oh, that's really scary because all these people were in the industry for years, mm. going on to do their full license. And I just went, oh, this is really sad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah. um, so uh, with that, I was waiting for that license to come through. I was bored twiddling my thumb, so I went, oh, well, in the same act as motor dealers, so I went and did the motor dealers license as well. So I stand up at an event, at, you know, back when we had events, um, <laughs> and I'd say to people, you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I've done, I've got accreditations in financial planning, mortgage broking, uh, real estate, and I'm a licensed motor dealer, so you can, can trust everything that I've got to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's funny. Bit of an icebreaker that one. <laughs> that's <laughs> one of the best. Oh, good stuff, mate. Good stuff. Now, um, so. <coughs> What we're going through at the moment is, you know, what they're calling a crisis or a pan, you know, a pandemic. Yep. And um, we touched about it, difference of opinion in relation to um, what the property market may or may not do over the next couple of years, um, based on who you speak to. But given your experience, and and you mentioned it briefly, property works in cycles. Can we go back through history and make comparisons to with events? you know, like the GFC and those sort of things to try and get a bit of an idea of, you know, what's potentially happening or are we, is it just completely so left the field, this coronavirus pandemic thing whereby there's no 
uh, I suppose, level, uh, basis level to, to work off. Yeah, I mean, so we went through GFC, as I said, we went, went in, you know, telling people not to buy and then GFC hit it, ha- happened, mm. hit. And uh, it's not particularly, you don't earn much money as a buyer's agent when you tell people not to buy. Yeah, that's <laughs> right, so yeah. So that was, that was a fun time. And uh, and then it, I had plenty of time on my hands, right, in that. And I, and I said, well, you know, no one could not have experienced this or seen, not necessarily seen this coming, but, you know, th- this has to not be just totally off the cuff. Mm. I'm not saying anything was planned or whatever. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, you know, there's people out there making a lot of money in this time that have been prepared for it. You know, how were they prepared? What did they know about that sort of thing? So I started looking into that and I come across um, you know, some info from an Australian guy who I mentioned before, Phil Anderson, uh, who'd uh, designed... Uh, well, he, so he'd come to this conclusion as well uh, many years earlier before GFC and he'd looked back through about 170 odd years of, of financial cycles and started to piece together time frames on them and uh, he looked at uh, WD Gann's work and a few others and he's, he'd written a book uh, called The Secret Life of Real Estate and Banking and yeah, that's it. There's a book there. And Do you um, recommend that one for the people watching? I, I recommend that you try and get through it. Yeah, it looks like a big book. It's, <laughs> it's pretty big and it's it's uh, very dry. It's full of data. But yeah, it's, right. it's an interesting read. So he goes through and maps every cycle. And he'd broken the cycle down into about 18 and a half years, 18.6 to be exact, according to Phil. And, um, and it's sort of made of two halves. It's made up of seven years up or sideways, a one one year to one and a half year sort of mid cycle, seven years up or sideways, then three and a half years down. And that's how that was sort of put piece together as an average of all these cycles he looked at. Was that over like a hundred years or Yeah, it was over hundred and seventy odd years. Or okay. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and so I started looking at that and watching his stuff and it was it was quite intriguing and interesting and I looked more into it and said, Oh yeah, okay, let's see if we can where this is going to go and so he was fairly right on a lot of his dates going through from GFC onwards um, and that made it interesting to me so I started looking you know fairly into it heavily got the book read it and I thought yeah there's some good stuff in here to answer your question is that if according to what Phil's cycle says is that right now we're in a mid <coughs> excuse me mid cycle mm-hmm. okay so we're at the halfway point so it's it's the 12 to 18 month you know tumultuous time okay so it's not a major crash uh, that we saw like in gfc mm-hmm. um that's expected from say 26 27 onwards according to his clock and cycle if that is the case then the last time this happened was the early 2000s and if you remember that say oh one ish time mm-hmm. um it, that was sort of stuff that was the it uh, the tech Yep. Bubble or dot something. Com. Com. Dot yep, com. Dot com bubble, yep. Um and then after that we saw big runs on markets, right? And property markets mm. and stock markets up to GFC. So if that's sort of the re- repeat of that, then yeah, we are seeing this here. We what I would suggest would lead that is that we're gonna come out of recovery quicker than expected. I'm not saying we are, I'm saying this is what would lead to that type mm. of event. If we come out quicker than we expected then everyone is like, hey, we're awesome, let's go, right? This really wasn't that bad. Buy yep. sentiment, as you yep. mentioned earlier. The sentiment increases, you know, the confidence is high because it really wasn't as bad as what we thought, mm. so let's get back to business. People right? have saved more than ever. <laughs> yep, and you're hearing all this stuff now, right? This is the mm. rhetoric that's out there. You know, Australia was never meant to be sharp. We need to be back to business, all this sort of stuff. Is all the talk is starting in that way. Yeah, pl- prices are set to boom. Exactly. All these articles the, the are The talk's out. already yeah. happening. Mm. And by the talk, it ends up being then the walk starts happening afterwards. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think that's what we're going to say. As much as I'd like to say we're going to get some really good buying because I like getting good buying for my clients, mm. you know, I'm not saying we won't see it, but I don't think we'll see it for an extended period of time. Yeah. And I think it's also going to be th- more than ever having the, uh, I suppose, the advisor, someone like yourself, because... I'd imagine right now in such a dynamic market with so many different, so the, uh, you know, a lot of people think you just buy a property every 10 years, it'll double no matter where it is, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. Gunda Windy's as good as Brisbane or Warwick's as good as, you yeah. know, Dubbo or wherever it may be. 
Um, but it's just not the case, is it? So having someone on your side who's who's researching markets and, and doing that analysis is going to be more important than ever because the shift and the change of things, you know, if you look at, you know, if we have troubles in exporting, you know, resources or minerals out of the ground, those mines aren't uh, as, you know, as functional, et cetera, et cetera. Those towns aren't as holding many people. Yeah. You know, those prices don't grow as quickly as what they would have in normal normal times. Well, that's that's right. And a lot of advice, I mean, y- you go to different spectrums, right? You've got real estate agents, and I'm not against real estate agents. Mm. I mean, I have to be a real estate agent. I am what I am. Um, and and I've got a plenty of agent mates, and there's plenty of good agents, and there's we all know there's not so good ones, right? I mean, that's but that's the same in any industry. Yeah, yeah. That's not really except builders, mate. Same <laughs> with builders. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, that's that's look. It, we all know it's the same in every industry. Yeah. So you, you know what we need to look at is that you look at them, and then you have got those advisors you're talking about, like guys like buyers agents that are focused on representing the client. Mm. Um. And but that advisor spectrum is made up of sort of transactional, which is like buyers agents, versus you know like a full property advisor, uh, like like us, like a qualified property investment advisor, um, who look at different things. Now in that group as well, they're broken up. So there's guys that simply focus on the data and the property and the areas, and they give you every chart and this and that, mm. and like really technical stuff. And there's probably less of them, but more like me, where I focus on the person, right? I mean, I come into real estate and, uh, you know, like an agent will be able to say, yeah, that's, oh, I don't know your name, but I remember selling you 13 Smith Street. Mm. You know what I mean? Or you were, the, whereas I have no idea who the address is. I couldn't care less, right? Yeah, yeah. It's about the, it's the person. So we start with a personal approach and it sounds like really cliche, but, you know, well I've had people come and say, I want to buy a property. I'm like, well, why? Why do you want to be a landlord? Mm. Do you want holes in your wall? Oh, no. What, what do you want? You don't get holes in your wall, do you? Well, you can. <laughs> you can oh. have them not pay rent some weeks too. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you, you want to not pay rent? No. What? Really? <laughs> you know, they have no idea. So you have to go through that process of why do you want to do this? Mm. You know, what is this for? What are you trying to achieve out of this? Mm. Oh, I was down the pub and mate bought one, so I thought I'd buy one. Eh. Bad mm. move, right? Like, yeah. What do you got to do this for? Mm. So you, once you start with that, y- you know, the, the property is the end result of it. It's not the start of the mm. process. It's the end of the process. And you've really got to think like that because it's so individual. And like, like every property is different. Everybody's circumstances is different. Mm. Yeah. It's like when they want to buy a property, it's like, well, we actually, you need to check what you can do as well, not that you want to buy a house. Yeah. What, can, what type of house can you actually afford to buy? Is another thing, and that's, that's not the result that you want. Okay, well, this is what you need to change in your life to actually buy a good investment. You actually need to make these changes, pay these debts out, etc. Because yeah. right now, just buying. Okay, I'm going to buy a house. Okay, we you can afford a townie, forty k's out. But yeah. well, let's just <laughs> buy it. We'll we'll start that as the stepping stone well, for your investment that's portfolio. It. There's a there's <laughs> a good cow paddock at Red uh, Red Bank Plains. You can sell <laughs> but the um, like I, I, and you got to work like that because I, I remember driving down the highway from Sunny Coast to Brisbane once, and the client rang, and it taken the search had taken a little while. Like we're not that fast in our search; we're not slow. Like from all up from woe to go, which would be three months, including settlement and stuff like that. But sometimes people want it like yesterday, mm. right? And this guy was chasing. He wasn't hassling me, but he rings me like every second day. He got anything? Got anything? Like if I got something, I'd blim and first you'd see the photos, mm. right? And I would have told you. And I can't remember his name, and um, and I and I was in the car, and I said, "Okay, Phil, right, I I found the place." He goes, "Oh, really? What? Talking to me now?" I said, "Yeah, no, I'm just going to pull off at this exit. I'm going to find the first house I can with a for sale sign. You're going to buy it." No, 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 I don't want that. I don't <laughs> want that. He says, I'm like, "Well, why are you hassling me?" I said, "Because I can do that if you want, or I can actually get you something that really suits you." Yep, no, nah, it's all right. He never called me again until we got the right one, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, you, you got to be like that because you can't, like, wha- who, why are you going to rush spending $500,000? Mm. You know? Like, people, women, research what type of water to get or the the packet noodles or chips or whatever, mm. and then they go, oh, buy a property. Here you go. Yeah. 500K. Let's just buy this one. I went to an open home on the weekend and we signed a contract. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> Why did you do that? Yeah, yeah. it was yeah. Al- it was awesome house. Oh. Yeah, great. <laughs> so, mate, 
it, so when you're when you're looking at you mentioned there it's got to be you take a personal approach each person is different so then would each um, I suppose you're not recommending any particular type of property in when I say that I mean house and land or existing apartments you're really looking at what that individual needs to to match their why yeah look I mean at the end of the day it's there's only s- th- everyone is individual, but they're still going to fall into a certain category, mm. right? Uh, they're either going to be hardcore by existing, or don't really care, so we can look at existing or new, or are really aggressive. They want to do something. Uh, say development is really broad, mm. right? Development can be reno, can be splitter, can be full on development, right? So they, th- you know, they're going to fit into those categories. Mm. So we go through a process of risk profiling. So we, th- the client. Uh, relays to us what their perceived risk profile is and then we have a series of questions that we go through which then indicates to us what their actual risk profile is mm. most of the time they line up it's a sort of a a similar version to you know what a financial planner does mm. uh, so we go through that process with them and we make sure that they're being classified because there's not much point saying yeah man i'm like i'm bet it all on black and yeah, you yeah. Know, and then they answer the questions and they're like a 50 year buy and hold mm. answer like there's going to be a severe disconnect to yeah. expectations there for them. So we need to make sure that lines up. And it's not a hard process. In fact, we're in the process of digitising at the moment, making it so that anyone can do it, just jump on the link, do mm. it, and, and prints out sort of your snapshot. Um, but it's a necessary process so that people know what they're expecting and then you can start to put some options. So if they are a lower risk, well, that's going to mean we can we can do a house and land package, mm. right, for a buy and hold, or we can do an established property, or we can do this and that, and so in there there's still a myriad of, of answers mm. and options, but they're always going to fall into a category based on risk. Um, mate, in relation to new homes, from a builder standpoint, I suppose for us, whilst the doom and gloom of of coronavirus for the economy and a lot of industries have had, you know, struggles and whatnot. Uh, I've made the comparison in the construction space, particularly the new housing space in which we're, we're involved in. It's been like watching the world burn while sitting in a spa mm. on the back of the stimulus that's come out from the, from the federal government, the home builder um, grant, which I'm sure you've, you've, you've heard about. Yeah. That then, um, does that then, because what we're noticing is a massive avalanche come into the market of purchases literally over the space of overnight. We went from, you know, crickets to herds, full on. on. It went from zero to 100 overnight. And without, and when they say it went to 100, we just assumed we're at 100 because no one really knew what was going on with the home (laughs) builder either. It was just like, okay, we're we're fucking doing it. Let's go. It's like you said, they were talking about it. Articles came out. People were walking that day. Yeah, Yeah. that's right. We're walking to buy. It's like, why are you buying? It's 25 grand. Yeah. Do you know how to get it? No, but I'm going to buy. (laughs) It just worked perfect to get buyers out there, right? So there's still not a lot of answers in relation to that. Um, And people, as Tom said, are just walking out the door and going into land estates and buying blocks. On the back of that, we're starting to notice in relation to back to what you said about sentiment and and, uh, and confidence that the investors are wanting to get into that new space as well because they're seeing land estates like roll out the door 40, 50 blocks in in one time over a weekend. Do you think... Uh, you know, that's a, a, a wise choice to be getting on that as an investor or would you be a little bit concerned that that, that may be artificially inflated in terms of, of where the market's at on the back of the stimulus? Yeah, well, I think it would be... Uh, okay, so there'd be three types of investors in my head. There's the, there's a trader, mm-hmm. there's a speculator, and then there's kind of like a an investory long-term holding mm. type, or, you know, which can be longer view or cash flow sort of focus. So depending where they fit in that category, depend on their appetite for doing this. The longer term investors, I don't think are necessarily rushing in. Mm. I think it's the speculators and traders that are rushing in and they're going to be doing one of two things. They're probably going to be either thinking that, you know, they've seen some rental yields going up, so you mm. might be able to capture some uplift there. But probably more likely is, well, if they're all selling out of land and there's still a demand, you might be able to build it and flip it on. Mm. Yeah, That's probably where they're going to sit. I don't... Until the long-term average in your area of rents go back to, you know, sorry, the, until they return to their long-term average, you're just not going to see I- investors back on, on, if there's no yield, mm. right? 
And now that yield can be specific for the area. Like in Sydney, it could be 3.5%. Mm. In southeast Queensland, it could be 5%. But if you're at 3.8% in southeast Queensland, investors aren't going to be interested, mm. right? Because they're going to say, well, it needs to get to 48 to 52 before I'm happy to do something again. Yeah. Which some areas are achieving. Wh- which they are, in which yeah. case they will attract the investors. Mm. Yeah. yeah, like Sunny Coast runs hot. There's Absolutely. certain areas in Brisbane that run hot that investors are sitting yep. there ready... And they've got a threshold. The thresholds, as soon as the stage is released, the threshold of twenty percent or ten percent investors is allocated that day because they've got buyers ready, yep. mm. waiting to buy in that area. So you do have that in some locations, and like you see, the, bu- the investors are ready to buy. Yeah, but yeah. in the areas where they're just selling and it's to owners yeah. because of the grant, you still have to have those other things there. Unless mm. they're a speculative investor, you've got to have that yield there underpinning it yeah. as a long term mm. hold. And mm. I think an investor, as well as looking at like. Are they extend? You know, these grants are being extended or not? We don't know. But the job keeper and what's March going to look like next year? What's June yeah. going to look like? For what you're looking at, p- you know, cash flow wise, what are the yields going to be? How are people coping? What jobs are going to be lost? What businesses are going to be standing? Yeah. Next year, not. So okay. it's funny how you said. Well, yeah, it goes back to where you're saying the articles come out. People talk, you know, and they introduce new stimulus packages, but then everyone buys based on that. <laughs> But that's all <laughs> they've they've sp- they've sp- they've made it you know cho- they've chosen it you know they they had the option to go to the investor or the owner occupier or both yeah but it was driven towards the owner occupier to go this is why you should buy now so everyone actually went and did it well it, uh, it drove it them to go and actually make it happen when there's really no reason there's twenty five grand look th- it's a it's a football right I mean mm. it's a political football that one mm. I mean you know th- investors already get. Uh, you know, it gets said that they get way too many benefits from the government mm. through negative gearing and tax write-off, et cetera, et cetera. So there was just no way that they were going to bring a housing benefit out for investors. I tell you, there right? was talk in the early days yeah. and I'm thinking this is about to go ballistic. Yeah, if the will, that, that people were convinced, like yeah, some investment yeah. people I was speaking to like, we're both going to get the yeah. owner occupiers <laughs> yeah, and investors, yeah, yeah. and it's going to yeah. drive. Wishful crazy. thinking, maybe more so than practical. Yeah. yeah, so they were always going to push it towards, yep. you know, the, the owner. Mm. And I think it was good going to owners and first homeowners. Um, I, you know, there's probably argument both sides on that, but I can see why they did that, and that's the choice they made. The issue that first homeowners have is that, generally speaking, they play in a lot of the same space as an investor. Mm. You know, like if you're talking about a four hundred to five hundred thousand dollar property, et cetera, et yeah. cetera, that's where the yields are. So that's where investors sit. So if you want first homeowners in the market, you don't really want investors in the market yeah. because then the first homeowners complain. And first homeowners are really, uh, you know, it's an oxymoron of feelings, right? I mean, you want to get <coughs> the cheapest price property you can as a first home and get best deal, but as soon as you own it, you're not a first homeowner anymore. Yeah, yeah. You're a homeowner. So then you want the price to go up. It doesn't matter if your mates. Yeah, want a yeah that's yet. right. You <laughs> complain about affordability <laughs> until the day you own a that's house. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's this, yeah. it's this whole thing. And the <coughs> other issue that you've got with first homeowners um, is that they're also playing in a lot of areas in a downsizer space. Mm. So and and first homeowners until this grant come along will always get beat by downsizers because they'll probably cash. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You got fast finance, ca- yeah, all cash, all cash, and equity, re- yeah, yeah it's right. nice and easy. Yeah, so hey. it's it's a hard yard for them because they want the nice house and whatever. Mm. You know, there's plenty of homes further out, and that's what developers are doing. They're looking at I could take this expression of interest from you, or I can take you know from the two 25 year olds. Yep. Can I get it from the 50 year olds that have 250 grand, yeah, 300 grand in the bank? That's right. They've got high incomes. They're probably going to be approved quicker. So we'll just. We'll accept this expressions of interest because it's more likely to settle. That's and that's what happens. That's so then what happens. if that mm. estate sells out on their 40 block release yeah. and there's no more releases for the next six months there and they want to buy now because they're now worried of the 25 grand they might miss out on, what are they going to go do? Most likely drive further down the road into yes. an area that might not be the best investment for them because it's they're buying their first home. It's an investment in my eyes, but... So you go, dr- you drive down the road ten minutes, and now you're buying an area that, oh, I just because of the twenty five grand, I'm going to buy this. Yeah, and that's where it's like, is that, is that a good enough reason to buy for the twenty five grand? Sometimes where you, I think the twenty five grand is great if you're, 
planning on buying, you're working towards it or ready to do it, yeah. Yeah. and it brought it forward for you or enabled it or gave you more buffer or whatever, it's awesome. But if you hadn't had a house and you went, oh, I've got now I can get 25 grand, I'd never thought about that before, let's go do it. Eh, yeah. wrong, wrong reason, right? Wrong it's the same yeah. as the people who ring me say, I want to buy negative gear property. Why? Oh, I pay too much tax. You don't do a property strategy for tax reasons. Mm. And this is a very similar thing. You don't buy a property for a grant reason. You buy a property, you use the grant if you're already going down that track. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And you're in the, yeah. Mate, um, we mentioned it in there quickly, you are you develop property for yourself, your own portfolio? Uh, with, with clients, yeah. With, well, with clients, yep. Some pretty big numbers there, 20, 30 million I spoke about. Yes, oh, they're old numbers, mate. Oh, That's right, uh, under soldier. No, 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 That was That was, you know, coming into you know, the last boom time in the cycle, right. you know, there was a lot underway that we were helping manage, yeah. Yeah, sure. right. So, mate, where does that fit in? Is that something uh, under the Zenium brand? Uh, well, it is because it's an aggressive strategy. Yeah. So that was really where we went. We sort of, you know, s- put that into a program. So the concept of that is that someone, you know, more established has, you know, $150,000, $300,000, you know, come to me and say, I want to buy another property, but you know, really, is this the best we can do? So yeah. Well, no. Let's let's make that money work for you over the period of the next, you know, two, three, four years, right? And in that time, generate one or two sort of housing deposits off it, or return off that money to pay down your personal home debt, mm. and then you still got your original capital that we can recycle. So the the concept is. Let's take the most basic concept in the Zenium um, strategy would be duplexing, right? Okay. So uh, they're hard to get the right ones, but you need to try and find them. And you go in and you spend, say, I'll just re- use round figures, mm. let's say, you know, 800000 all up on a duplex. Yep. And then you sell them after costs for like 900000 right? Just you know, do round figures. Yep. Not always that good, but we usually work on about, we aim between 8 and 12% of, cost as a return on duplex so on that instance be anything from say 64 grand to you know almost 100k but so that's where we're looking at so uh then they would have had say 200,000 in on a duplex Mm. done the duplex build it sold it out they come out with their 200 then say plus in this example another 100 so you've got to pay your tax on 100 but they still got their 200 right so either they take that 70k after tax and they either bank it, right, spend it, take it off their home loan, you know, do whatever, but they still got their original 200, then they go again. Is that, right? just quickly, is that, that what's the tax rate on that profit? Is it like C, like CG tax or? Well, if it's 12 months and a bit. Yeah, okay. So you can get an exemption. I'm just using worst case. We use yeah. company tax rate 30% in okay. our calculations yep. right, until we know what someone's doing. Okay. So on 100K, we'd say 70K, yep. right? All right? But yeah, if you hold it for more than 12 months, so by the time you build, get a tenant in, then sell, you know, and date the contract correctly, then you're looking at over 12 months. Yeah. So, you know, there's strategies around that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it could be better than that. And, you know, it generally it is better than that. So, they're th- you know, and that's where they're being aggressive every 12 to 18 months. They can... Yeah, Look correct. at cycling that two hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand they've put in there, get sixty to seventy back, yep. pay seventy thousand dollars in two years off the principal price of residency, correct. try or put in an offset account. Yep. Either way, or go again, and, yeah. and just go again. And so then what will happen is, say they do that twice, they got one hundred and forty k there. Then and that, let's just say they weren't paying off their home mm. debt, but then they can start to achieve the buy and hold side that they wanted to achieve. And they can either do that by building in duplex next year and keeping one, but they don't want to hold a duplex. They don't have to do that. They can just work on the little strategy. Um, and they still got that original 200 they had, right? But now they've got 140 that they've made, mm. you know? And so that 140, they can go into a buy and hold. And they've still got the 200 working over here to do whatever. That's just yeah. one example. Same thing, guys put 200 into property development projects, you know, and they, they get back their returns over the 12, 24 months on that. And so you do like the full, you know, so if you if we talk like a project, 10, 15 lots or whatever it may be, are you guys assisting with the whole like DA development approval process? Yeah, nah. On commercial we do, but yep. it's, it's only because the land is already zoned for commercial, yeah, yep. so it's more of like I'd call it BA than a DA. Yeah. Um, 
depending which state you're in. But with land sub, we were involved in getting the DA, but the, the time frame just took too long. So our strategy changed about 18 months ago to just doing approved sites. Okay. So you make a little bit less on them, but the problem is it's the time cost of money and then the speed of money, which is money velocity. So and you've you got to balance those two things. And you take a whole heap of risk out of the equation. Yeah. Well, too. you do. <laughs> it's the time risk, right? Yeah. Because it all goes to, to pear shape. And mm. it's the same thing. We once we were always changing strategy to make sure it works. So we we had three projects working coming into Corona, um, and those across those three projects we had financing uh, indicatively approved, uh, subject to valuations and all that sort of stuff. And we were going through them, doing them. We paid for valuations, and they come up pretty good. Um, and those three projects we needed five hundred k to settle those projects with the bank funding, right? The lender funding, I should say. And then Corona hit, and they're all due to settle around March, April, May. <laughs> and the whole thing just turned to poo, mm. right? And these these lenders pulled out, said, no, we're not doing that anymore. And then we went to other lenders, and they said, yes. And then you go through an application, no, we've changed our rules. So we said, oh, stuff this, we're not going to use lenders. We'll settle the sites in cash. So in Corona, we had to go back to our partners, then we put in 500K and say, we need an extra 1.5 million. So we had to go and raise an extra one and a half million in Corona to settle those blocks of land. Yeah, right. So that's what I spent my isolation time. Yeah, doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember yeah. talking to you, talking um, with it through as it was going on, and I think I called day of settlement on one of them oh that right. afternoon. <laughs> it's just a nightmare, right? But what it's done is, is we've now made that a rule going forward. So because of the uncertainty of what's going on, mm. um, we now just restructure our deals so that when we go forward now, we settle the land in cash land and costs in cash, right, with our equity partners. And then we get it all approved, ready to go, planned and all that. And then we go to do some pre-sales where possible and get construction funding after that. So now there is no time cost. I mean, it's still the equity time cost, mm. but we just take away that risk. So you've always got to change with, you know, with the markets yeah. and with what's going on. And I, and I suppose, I mean, that's a good indication or a good... Um, point of what a lot of businesses and, and companies have done is coronavirus, coronavirus uh, has ultimately proved, uh, I suppose, a, a uh, unforeseen event that's forced your hand in terms of changing a lot of business models. You know, if you look at distilleries, you know, making hand sanitizer and, and all that yeah. sort of stuff. I think there's always opportunities in these times. Yeah. We see that, and, and you never, unless you find them in the time, mm. they're easier to find when you look back look five back. years yeah, time, yeah. right? Um, but what I find that these events do is that they speed up already happening trends. Mm. Okay, so oh, retail's gone bad, whatever, whatever. Well, retail was already going, going bad. Online shopping was already right. killing it. It yeah. was already increasing. Yeah, um, you know. The same with the whole, you know, Zoom wasn't created in February. Yeah. I mean, for those of us in this room, we probably use Zoom for years, yeah. right? But no one, like you talk to your mother or something, she wouldn't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now my 95-year-old grandmother uses Zoom in a nursing home. Yeah, yeah. Right? I have been using a Meagle, you know. <laughs> <You've heard laughs> no. But the point is, this stuff wasn't created overnight. Yeah. These are trends that are forced by these influences yeah. that happen. And it's the same, I'd argue, now with, say, uh, commercial office space in town. Mm. Yeah. You know, there was already a, trend, a bit of a trend to, like, you know, split, uh, or what they still, a hot desk share. Hot desks, and yeah. You know, all this sort of stuff. And uh, you're just going to see it being, you know, opened up more because of this sort of thing. I mean, I've spoken to uh, a client last, last week who works at a major bank, in uh, the IT section, and uh, they're all still working from home, mm. right? And him and his, he said, him and his mates all said, well, we don't know if we're going to go back um, because they don't know if what they're going to do, uh, and we don't need to go back. Mm. So it's changed. He, he was ringing me to say, now I want to get out of my townhouse and I want to buy a, a house twice the price with a bigger house. Better quality living because he's going to be there more. Yeah, and, yeah. He, and, I, and he goes, I hate getting up in the morning. I said, what do you mean you hate getting up in the morning? He goes, well, because this house isn't set up for me, it feels like i am never left work. He goes, so well, my next house is going to have a big one or two rooms separate for the office where I can close it off mm. and I feel like I'm home and I've got aspect and view and whatever. You know, So these people that were living in these styles of property close in town now going, 
I don't need to be there. So where are they going to go? Where's the trends yeah. happening? Well, I, I rent where I live and, you know, you'd leave the office at 8 at night and you leave for gym at 5 in the morning. You're there at 8 o'clock at night. You're there six days a week at work. You come back, you're like, I'm paying rent for... Yeah. Not to be there. So you don't really care where you're living, right? Because you're just at work. But if it flips the other way and then you have a nice office, so then it flips the other way, it's like, I want a really good... Yeah, I want right. a backyard. I want to have a full study in the house. And that's where we've had to change our designs rapidly to... And we already work yeah. like 12 months ago putting studies standardly in all the houses yeah. to actually have some space. And now it's like when you're looking, speaking to property managers, like this is part of what people want now. It's like instead of two air cons now, which was a standard for most um, project builders, now it's like they want dark or they want an extra air con in the study in room. study, yeah. And now it's like, well, because we're going to work from home the whole time. That's, mm. a, that's now a breaking point for me. So it's like once again, it's changing it, it what changes. people wanted. So now the product's different. And now it's like having a bigger house is actually more beneficial where 180 was fine five years ago. 180 yeah. square metre home. I don't ne- think it was ever fine, but let's just say it was. Uh, and now it's, it's like... You're talking to the wrong man if you think that's fine. <laughs> no, no. Oh, yeah. And like I didn't think it was... Well, you've seen ours. Yeah. It's all 210 right. plus. And that's where we get the result. And you're going to get them the rent because people... Are, well, when we are at home, we can actually enjoy the space we've mm. got. Yeah. Instead of, you know... It makes a huge difference. But as you said, it, it, you know, this event is more so just increased yeah. the the movement in 180 not being fine and now <laughs> 210 is where it needs to be at. Yeah. Yeah. And that was always the case, right? as we know. Yeah. But it's just now people are aware of it that that's not functional. And yeah. it changes, you know, regional dynamics mm. as well because I- how many people are now saying, I mean, not that you'd ever want to live on the Gold Coast, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, why, why would I live near the cities? Any city, yeah. right? I can go to the Central Coast or Gold Coast or Sunshine Coast yeah. or even, I mean, Cairns if they wanted to, like whatever. Why would I, why, if I can work from home, why wouldn't I get up in the morning and go and walk along the beach or mm. or have a cow or whatever, like <laughs> live on some acreage, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like it's changing people's. So I think the losers in the, the property space from residential is that inner city middle ring Mm. because they're either going to move into the city when the office space changes to residential, quirky, cool residential stuff, which is what it will. Or the old wall stalls and stuff. Yep, that's it, Um, with their wall gardens and air, (laughs) you know, because the cities were well fed. Yeah. We've got to remember that some of the regional areas weren't as well, you know, the transport stopped and that, people Mm. remember that. Or they'll move further out because they want a chicken. Yeah. You know, and they can't have that in the little area, so they'll move further out. So that's... That's what I reckon. And it'll be interesting to see how the regional markets perform because historically I've been like, well, I'm not going near it, high risk, not for me, you know. Um, But one of the trends that um, I've been hearing about is people are are considering regional areas more lifestyle because they know the fact that they can – working from home used to be a bit of a, you know, a bludge, a bludge day. I'm going to work from home today, mate. And you're like, okay, he's doing nothing all day. He's going to watch Fox Sports and, (laughs) (laughs) and, you know, watch replays of cricket. But now it's a, it's it's sort of working effectively and, and people don't have to be nearby with like Zoom and all that Regional sort of will be a big winner. It, it hands down will. And because it was also, you can go to some towns, including ones you mentioned earlier, yeah. that wouldn't even know what COVID was. Yeah. Right? They have no idea. Now nothing's changed for mm. them. And that can be pretty appealing to some people. Correct. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, if you look at you know, states as a whole in terms of Queensland, like we're pretty much back to normal, you know, in, in most regards in terms of the how we interact. We're shaking hands again. And we're doing all that sort of stuff. It's just space. Oh. You've got to have your I think certain other amount of space between That's each other. right. And other that's states it. would argue whether Queensland was ever normal. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Hang on, let me ask me second hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. My scars itchy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the... Uh, but, you know, it's appealing and there were some figures thrown around that, uh, you know, a lot of Southerners have applied to come up when the borders open mm. and, you know, these sort of bits and pieces uh, to potentially move. And I think that we will see a big trend in that and I think you'll see things like the grey nomads around the place mm. uh, who kind of all went back home, which is part of the issue, especially on s- places like Sunshine Coast uh, and where they would traditionally reside. Mm. Um they've come back to their houses and therefore the rental market's in big demand. So you'll see people like that who can, who are cashed up or can move easy or whatever will probably relocate. Yeah, to a lifestyle. I mean, today, 
you're 31 on the weekend, you can't really complain about the weather. So much yeah. to so 12 much to degrees love. at night. Yeah, Gold Coast. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, um, last question before we let you go and, and get back to uh, get back to your busy schedule, I'm sure, is what are you thinking about, you know, like the international market? Are you still ac- across, you know, what's happening in the US, obviously with the debate happening today? Do you, do you see that they're going to be a lot worse off in terms of their property market? Is that something you're going to explore looking at again or you think Australia is 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 the best market right now internationally? <laughs> you grouped, you gr- grouped the 50 other countries and that. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, what about Tanzania? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's right. I mean, let's go Portugal. So the, the US yeah. is, uh, I mean, look, it's like anything. The Australian market is not one market. The US mm. market is not one market. There's a whole bunch of little markets. Mm. And you'll always find, you know, winners and losers <coughs> in each area. Um, the Australian market, the more a market is is controlled or regulated, the, the less it can sort of perform in some regards, okay? So there is a lot of control and regulation in the Australian market. So by that I mean that it means that it might not have the high highs and the low lows that other markets do, like in the US, they really can be pretty boom must, and there's less control and a lot of stuff there. The rental, as I said before, the rental management's not the same. You know, there's all sorts of stuff that's all different. The lending rules are different. I mean, I've been through stuff in Chicago where, um, back at GFC, where they were doing the cash for keys. I don't know if you knew what cash for keys no. were. No, so no, no. cash for keys was, um, was they were paying homeowners to leave their homes that were defaulted on the loans, right? So over there, it had non-recourse loans, so you could just walk away. But... Um, you, especially in those colder areas, uh, you can get a lot of money for copper. So all the copper would be removed from the house. So I've been in. I've got photos of me in basements with brand new hot water systems where they just snipped off at the top and all there. But the problem, like all the pipes, pipes pulled out, and that creates leaking, and then the the water freezes, and the homes are getting destroyed. And I've it got photos of like because they had the olds. They're quite old houses, so they you know don't know I mean, maybe you guys still build like this but they, they got the timber literal timber slats there that then actually physically plaster over right, right? we're not talking gyp rock here yeah right. <laughs> plaster and and the the light switch is in there and then two two lines pulled up all the way up because they pulled the light switch out and they just pulled the copper out yeah wow because right? they wind the copper up and get it so the bank said oh these houses are getting destroyed they're flooding from water leaking in the house from the house so we're going to offer you cash for keys so here's five hundred thousand bucks, whatever, to leave your house alone. Give us the keys and get out. So they owed the bank money, and they're still getting money to pay to get out. So they do very different things over there to what we see here. Yeah, right. So where do I see the market going? Were well, they putting a lot larger deposits on the properties over there though? For the, so nah, the bank, you get one hundred fifteen percent lending over there. Is awesome. Yeah, bro. Right. How crazy. So we're over here, it's like you've got to put a larger deposit down for less risk for the bank for resale, but then you're also to blame. You know, they're going to pin you. But as you, you said, it's yeah, safer, isn't it's it? There's no yeah. recourse on the person, so you yeah. just walk away. How crazy is that? <laughs> it was pretty good. One of the appeals, I went over there. <laughs> would I look at doing it again? Yeah, I would. Um, I think that, you know, no matter who wins the US presidential election, it will create a form of stability. All elections do that. Mm. It, you know, what happens after that is going to depend on who's in there and the, the things they do and whatever. But the markets then know, you know, person A or person B is in for four years, mm. right? So that creates a sense of stability. At least we know what we're getting for four years, even if we don't like them or they're crazy with their rules or whatever, we know we're going to get that for four years. So that creates a form of stability. But there is some markets in the US that are very much going off. You know, and it can be related to other things. It can be localized markets. It can be transition from people going from blue states to other, you know, red states turning purple or whatever. Um, there's a whole bunch of industry around the pot industry. Mm. You know, medicinal mar- marijuana that's happening over there. There's all sorts of things going on over there. Mm. Yeah, mate. Well, look, um, certainly something to, uh, to to ponder, mate. How do uh, how do people get in contact with you? Oh, mate, they just phone 1 800 Scott. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right, Scotty. Uh, yeah, I mean, they can Scotty contact <laughs> they contact our office on 1300 667789 and yep. then they can look up propertyadvice.com.au. Yep. And they'll find us on that. Yeah. Awesome. And, mate, um, Zenium Live, uh, where, where you got 
watching that YouTube, LinkedIn, all sorts of... Yeah, so we're Zenium uh, on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, and there is a Zenium Live site coming, but we can get to it from the Property Advice site. Yep. But yeah, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, you know, whatever else. Yeah. <laughs> all the platforms. That's Zenium, X-E-N-I-U-M. Thank you so much for coming in today, mate. Really appreciate Pleasure. you uh, Thanks having a chat. Everyone watching, don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys.